What's good people, Stray Fresh Live here, OX105 FM in Oxford. We've been driving for an hour and a half, we're here with our boy Mark Devlin. We've been chatting online, nothing funny. We've been discussing music, I've been buying his books, but finally we meet. So nice to see you Mark, how you doing mate? I'm good man, good to meet you finally, as you say, after all this time. I know, I, I appreciate the invite up here, the directions, the postcode was slick, we got here in plenty of time, so... Well, sat now, you see, I'm an old school map reader myself, I'm reaching for road <laughs> atlases still, so you're doing it right. Exactly, now, yesterday in Bournemouth, it was absolutely scorching, the weather was beautiful, uh, the boys doing the filming were mocking my very white legs, and I thought, as we come up here to Oxford, it's going to be scorching, we're going to have a nice outdoor interview, but it's a little bit overcast. I'm, I'm not really happy with this, what's going on? British weather, man. I'd like to say it's an Oxford thing, but you know, it's like that everywhere today. So never make plans in Britain, because the weather will let you down. And before we go into our interview, and I've got a lot of questions to ask you about music and, and your career and things like this. Um, a question was put to me this week mm. about uh, DJ wear during gigs. Not in, not in general, but when it gets really hot. I mean, I've been, doing, I've been doing the radio show wearing shorts, I mentioned Max in particular, has been mocking me a lot. So for you personally, if you're DJing in, in, in that club or you're playing abroad and you know it's going to be really hot, it's going to be, you know, quite sweaty in the club. Are you a guy who goes for shorts? Do you keep it with trousers? Oh. Do you not even care? Tell me. Jeans all the way, mate. Trousers all the way. Like you, my legs are nothing. Nothing, nothing, <laughs> nothing to, to write home about. <laughs> exactly. You said it yourself. I'm just picking up on the point. Okay. Really, my legs are not for public consumption. <laughs> Pipe cleaners, very white, not not to be shown off. So trousers all the way. And let's talk about music. Let's get uh, serious. Let's get serious now. We've got the dress code out the way. Um, without giving away your age, you're a guy who's been in the industry, and been in the game a very, very long time. One question that's always put into me in terms of DJing is not only the many aspects of it, mm. is how to remain relevant and the longevity of being a successful DJ over time. Mm. Quite a hardish question for the first question for you in this interview, but how do you remain relevant and how do you keep the hunger going for so long from when you started mm. to 2012 and onwards to the future? Well, it's a very good question. Uh, I've been doing my thing since 1990, so it's 22 years now and uh, took me a while to get started, as it does most DJs. So I actually started out in radio before I got, got involved in clubs. I mm -hmm. uh, started out on a station here in Oxford called Fox FM, which was a big commercial station. And I was doing backroom production stuff. So I was tech hopping pre-recorded shows, and I was producing promos and jingles mm -hmm. and helping out in the newsroom, making the tea, all that sort of thing. Um, and one of the shows that I ended up producing came live from one of the clubs in Oxford. Okay. And it was with Graham Gold, who used to be on KISS FM. Mm. And he was coming live from Park End Club in Oxford every Friday night. So I used to sit in the studio and tech up that and fire all the jingles. And from that, I got an involvement in the club. And I got a hunger to actually start DJing in the club. Um, and something that had always held me back was just a, a nervousness and a fear of performing in front of a crowd of people. Okay. And it's something that I never got when I was doing radio, because mm -hmm. you're just in a, a room and you don't see the people that are listening. And I was very confident on the radio, mm -hmm. but I held back for a long while uh, from doing the clubs. But eventually I overcame that, got a slot at the Park End Club in Oxford, and that was what got me involved in club DJing. Mm -hmm. And so from there, um, I got the spark and I got the hunger and I wanted to build on that. So I sought out um, other gigs. This was obviously in the 90s when the music was very different to what it is now. And we'll come on to music real soon. I'm sure well, we I know you're passionate about I hope music. we will. But um, yeah, we're, we're talking about the 90s. And the music that I played in the club was uh, soul, swing, hip hop, um, and ragga, as mm. it was known back then. And I was playing the back room. And for the first few years of my club DJing career, it was all about the back room. Because back then, in the main room, you had house and dance music. Mm. And the back room is where you had the black music, R&B, hip hop, all the rest of it. As it's still sometimes, well, it still is referred to today, but that's a whole new world. Well, well, I'm, I'm sure we'll get on to that. But um, yeah, it used to be soul, swing, and, and ragga. Those mm. were the terms, you know, and, and that's what I used to play. And so uh, I, I just stuck strictly to, to that music. And back then, uh, I think Clubland was much more compartmentalized. Yeah. And you had crowds of people that were into a particular genre of music whether it was Jungle that was just emerging then, which had its own dedicated crowd, people that would only go to Jungle Raves, that's all they wanted to hear. Then when you went to the sort of rooms that I played, you'd have the R&B and hip hop crowd that just wanted to hear that music. Mm. And there was very little crossover. 
I think there's been a lot of blurring of the genres more recently. But back then it was it was quite easy. If you decided you wanted to be a hip hop and R and B with soul swing DJ, it was quite easy to just stay in that genre, stay in that groove, get your bookings playing those sort of clubs, those yeah. sort of venues. Um, and so that served me well for many years. But as the night is moved into the noughties, as you'll be well aware, mm. uh, the music started to change and people's perceptions of the music, people's attitudes towards the music started to change as well. And so uh, I think as a DJ, you then had to be prepared to diversify a bit and you had to start playing uh, a wider variety of genres if you wanted to stay relevant. So I kind of went with the flow of that for a number of years. But things reached a point where uh, probably in about 2007, 2008, I would say, that kind of, that, that those kind of times where I noticed that the music was changing so much and DJs that had previously been thought of as R&B hip hop DJs were being expected to play music that was so very different I know fr near, from, yeah. from what we started out playing. Yeah that I started to get very uncomfortable with it and I started to ask some questions about why the music is changing, why us guys are expected to play this. And, you know, let's call some names out. You know, I'm talking about the likes of Flo Rider and Akon and all that garbage started to come through then. And later you had all the David Guetta records and then, then you had Nicki Minaj jumping on the scene. Mm -hmm. Then Rihanna's music and Beyonce's music went from what was relatively bona fide R&B into straight yeah. pop. Yeah. Uh, and then Lady Gaga came on the scene. Uh, and then suddenly DJs that were supposed to be R&B DJs are, are being asked to play Lady Gaga. Mm. In terms of remaining relevant from, like, from starting in 1990 to 2012 now moving forward, is it a case of, for you and what you're about musically, you've stuck in this day and age now to the clubs, to the bookings, to the circuit of what you're about? Mm. And that's what's enabled you obviously you know, to, to continue with the high profile bookings across the whole of the globe really as well as lots of other work in the industry. So you've, you've stuck to your guns, which, you know, I've got to say props, because not, not a lot of people do. Well, to a certain extent, yeah, and I'm, I'm conscious of uh, addressing that question. Uh, what I was working around to is the fact that uh, you can choose to just go with the flow. Mm. If you want to get the bookings and you want to still play the big clubs, the music is clearly changing and you're expected to play a different sort of music to maybe what you did 10, 15 years ago. So one option is to just go with it and say to hell with it, yeah. uh, I'll play what needs to be played. Uh, it's not something that I've been comfortable doing because I've not wanted to put my name to certain styles and genres of music. So the only other um, option that's open to you really is to either keep on playing the underground real raw stuff that in yourself and make do with specialist underground nights maybe doing a radio show where you can play all that stuff yeah. um, but but not make a great deal of money and not get uh, the international bookings or diversify but on your own terms mm. uh, as far as it's possible to do that and that's something that, that I've found myself having to do over the last few years so a lot of the gigs that I play now I'm playing a very wide selection of music and it's outside of straight R&B, hip-hop, reggae, um, but I'm playing sort of a bit of classic soulful house or some club classics from back in the day or um, just what I consider to be the best of, of each genre mm -hmm. and if you're creative with your selections and if you get the balance right in terms of keeping the club manager happy, keeping the crowd moving Which and keeping your own cool. integrity mm -hmm relatively in place, it's something you can do. Definitely. Uh, so I've been in the game for a number of years and I've learned how to apply that. Uh, so that's really what I'm doing now. I think, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the points you've, this being the first time you've spoken, I know we could sit here for hours and discuss okay. the music and the changes and what's, and what's going on and, and how things have changed for better or for worse. But I've always been the believer that, you know, music does change over time, it does evolve. There's certain golden era, uh, eras or golden periods, we all know that, certain artists or records that we really love. And if you can flex to a certain degree, something that you're comfortable with, you can still go to a club and think, turn up at the club and think, right, well, looking at the crowd, looking at the people in here, it's a bit more mainstream than, than what I was perhaps hoping, but I can still play my set, I can still play the records that are going to work, but I can throw in those few classics, I can throw those new upfront tunes that exactly. I like, exactly. and keep it within the remit of what you're supposed to be about, and obviously the branding, and exactly. people understanding what they're going to get from Mark Devlin when they come to a Mark Devlin gig. That's right.
I mean, we all know certain A-list DJs. I won't name names here. You sure? You, you, you're, you're quick. To, uh, you're happy to drop uh, artists in there. Well, so you know, I'm still I'm still working in the, the industry, so I won't name names on this occasion. But you know, we all know certain mm. A-list DJs who have gone with the flow and they're just mm. playing whatever the big record companies are throwing at them mm. uh, without question. And you know, the, the, whether those DJs still have integrity and credibility as a result of that, uh, people must be the judge. Yeah. That was, that was amazingly diplomatic. <laughs> You've been asked that question before. Uh, no, but I plan the answer. You plan the yeah. answer. <laughs> you know what's coming. Um, obviously, in this day and age, the, the online presence of a DJ, and the, without being too cynical on the branding side of things, obviously extremely important for yourself. Um, Twitter. Always interested to see your, your comments on Twitter. Okay. Mainly music-based, like the discussion we've just had, but yep. obviously that's a great outlet for you to you know, voice your opinions on Indeed. clubs or yep. situations. Do you ever get yourself in trouble? Um, I've not got in any real trouble, but I've had a few people that I've known for a number of years come to me quite recently and say, mate, what are you doing? What are you doing? You can't say that. Making, making these comments. Um, and anyone that does follow me on Twitter or Facebook will be aware that some of my stuff is you know, quite outspoken. I have strong views about um, a lot of things that, that are going on in this world, and I'm happy to, to voice mm. my, my thoughts on those. So a few people have said to me, you need to be careful, mate, because uh, you've got a career here and you're going to piss a lot of people mm. off. Um, so, you know, watch what you're doing. Uh, I am still working in, in this game and I want to continue doing that, but I don't have to worry about things to the extent that I did sort of 15, 20 mm. years ago when I was starting out. And uh, I'm a great believer in real talk, in saying things that need to mm. be said. I think there's uh, a lot of bullshit, a lot of hypocrisy, a lot of uh, uh, things that go on that people don't comment on for fear of how it's going to affect the way they're perceived mm. or how it's going to affect their career. But these things need saying and, and somebody needs to come out there and say them. So um, that's what I'm doing. I'm yeah. happy to articulate my thoughts on things if I feel strongly about it and if I think people mm. need to apply a bit of thought to it. I think so, I think especially now with saying elements of censorship and you've mentioned before about maybe some DJs losing the integrity because of the, the financial aspect which is always a, a tricky balance for everyone. Well it is, yeah. Um, you know there can be a tendency to avoid you know, the glaring the obvious in terms of social commentary and what's going on for fear of not wanting to upset anybody or you know right. record companies sending us certain records and saying you know we'd like this to be charted or you know what do you think of this I expect you know I'd really like if you played in your clubs or in your radio show and you think this is so far removed from the music that they play, it's almost like their thoughts really gone into it. So That's right. sometimes when you voice those opinions, people can take it the wrong way. But I, I agree, there's an element of you've got to be real to yourself and who you are. And again, part of your reputation is built up from what you're about. So to suddenly change that just because of a financial aspect or the fact the game should be played a certain way, um, it's not something I really agree with either. So. You know. Well, it's, it's different. If you're just starting out now, if you're 18 or 20 mm. and you want a career as a DJ and, and you're starting out and this is the music you have to work with, it's all you've known mm. on, a, on a professional basis. So True. I'm sure you can embrace the music that's around mm. and, and make your name from it. But if you've been around as long as I have, people are going to remember you for playing mm. the music that you did when you first started out. And the music we're expected to play now is so far removed oh. from that. I don't personally want to be associated with it. I mean, let's be real. Uh, the, the music out there right now is is garbage, predominantly. You know, there's, there's mainstream R and B and hip hop. What passes for it? It's just absolute garbage. Uh, for a reason as well. It's systematically produced that way mm. uh, to an agenda, which is a whole different conversation. But it is it's, <laughs> it's, it's rubbish, man. It's it's got no musical integrity. It all sounds the bloody same. I sound like my dad. 20 years ago, when I was playing music in my bedroom, my dad would be shouting downstairs. What's that noise? It all sounds the bloody same. Turn it down. When it does, <laughs> he was right. Well, he's right about this stuff yeah. anyway. I think one thing that uh, I mentioned when some of the kind of new school DJs, like I said, they've been a year or two were thinking of buying equipment, thinking trying to get into DJing, I always say to them, look, this is what the music is now, this is what's going on, but go and research. Read those online articles, buy exactly. the books, look at the exactly. classic albums. Exactly. If you look at a countdown, you look at a specialist radio shows such as yourself, you think, well, oh, I've never heard of that artist. Mm. Go and do it. Find out your That's flashes. how you become a DJ. Because I was lucky enough when I started DJing in 98 or so to catch the tail end of what I'd call the real DJ apprenticeship. Mm. Carrying record boxes to clubs for the bigger DJs, handing out flyers, doing little warm-up yeah. sets, doing those bits and pieces. And I know the digital music 
discussion is again another discussion that we can have another day when we've got a full weekend free to talk. Yes. Um, but that element has been so lost now. You know, I mean, I've been using Soraya to DJ with for four or five years now, but people don't come buy a computer, buy some software, grab hold of some music, and then DJ. Mm -hmm. And you think that's that's not being a DJ. It's being a DJ was traipsing halfway around the country to find that one record. It was going through car boot sales, going through loads of old classical and and TV things. Yeah, and they go, yeah. oh my god, yeah. that tune's there, that's and right. it's only fifty odd p. Yeah. But I'm starting to sound. Old, old side now. So, yeah. <laughs> no, old school. Old school. Old school. <laughs> yeah, we've got to say an age now. We have to uh, old school. Lock that off nicely. Yeah. Um, also, we talk about online quickly. I mean, obviously, uh, the website, Black Sheep, as well. For those who don't know about the Black Sheep situation, um, heavy presence online. Very interesting. Yeah. And a lot, a lot going on there. So, explain Black Sheep in a nutshell to people who who don't know what's going on. Well, Black Sheep kind of mutated out of Blues and Soul magazine, which I wrote for for 10 years. Blues and Soul, if people don't know, was a legendary black music publication. It ran from 1967, hence the title Blues and Soul, uh, right through to 2007. 40 years, uh, published a thousand issues, and before issue 1001 came out, the company went bankrupt, and sadly the, the magazine was finished. So myself and two colleagues uh, decided to sort of try and keep the spirit of Blues and Soul alive, and recognising the way that everything was moving to online, uh, we realised that a print magazine was no longer going to work. Uh, it was no longer financially viable. So we decided on an online magazine, and we set up blacksheetmag.com, and it's across the board uh, black music, so it's R&B, soul. We don't really get involved in grime and, and funky and all the rest of it, so it's, it's mainly the styles of music that blues and soul used to mm -hmm. deal with. And a um, bit of outspoken, uh, stuff on there as well. I'd expect bit, nothing else. <laughs> bit, bit, you know, we've got, got this thing called the hoof to the head, which is where we just lay into mm -hmm. somebody that needs so, something that needs addressing. Something so, that needs to be you know, we've had David Cameron in there, Tony Blair, mm -hmm. Obama. Why do the music? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, it's mainly music based, but we like to sort of give you some other stuff as well, uh, which I think keeps it interesting. So that's at blacksheetmad.com. Um, then We've got the book. I'll get a quick plug in. Yeah, the book. Get in the book. that's the next question. So get on okay, the book as okay. well. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm uh, preempting you then. <laughs> but yeah, the book Tales from the Flip Side is the book that I put out in 2007. I had the idea of writing a book that uh, broke down what life is really like for non-superstar DJs. So you've got the likes of Fatboy Slim and Paul Oakenfold and mm -hmm. Carl Cox, and you know people see these guys and they think that's what DJing is all about. They think it's private jets, limos. Um, you know, champagne, uh, parties, uh, drugs, girls, all the rest yeah, of it. Sex, drugs, rock Maybe it is for these guys, but for me, and maybe for you as well, it's a little bit different. You know, I take Ryanair flights, I uh, stay in crusty hostels, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I ride the bus. Drive yourself to gigs. Uh, because that's what it's like for regular guys yeah. out there trying to make a living. And I thought, well, there's a book in this, because there's lots of funny stories and anecdotes that mm. I've picked up over the years, lots of crazy things that have happened that people would be surprised to know about. Um, and I've always enjoyed writing, so I thought, yeah, let, let's put it into a book. Um, and, and so that's what I did. I self-published the book five years ago. Um, and it's available online, Tales from the Flip, from the flip Side. It's on Amazon. Uh, which, is, which is where I should have my coffee, I should say. And it's actually a good read, so I think you should check it out. Well, I think the only thing that's really changed from when I wrote it is the section where I'm talking about DJ technology, yeah. you know, like we mentioned earlier. Um, back then, I was still playing vinyl. And in the book, I'm saying, oh, I'm, I'm sticking to vinyl, I'm not going with this bloody electronic <laughs> shift, you know. Now you can't do that. It's all moved so quickly that you can't play vinyl because the tunes aren't there. But that's the only chapter, I think, that maybe hasn't stood the test of time. I think all the rest of it is, is still very relevant. Yeah, definitely. I mean, even from my, from my experience, you've been in the game longer than I have. It was still interesting to see some of the stories, so, so many things I could relate to in terms of discussions with club managers, situations in clubs, and even though, as you just All mentioned, requests, requ <laughs> requests, the, yeah, the, the uh, DJ requests, yeah, the DJ request. Very quickly, what's the worst request you've ever had, Nick? Well, uh, or description I, of a request. I had one last night. This is very, okay. very topical because it's still in my mind. This bird comes up to me in a in a venue. This lady, time, okay, <laughs> and she said. Um, Oh, can, can you play something that's in the charts? Oh, here we go. Okay. So I usually test them and say, oh, what specifically did you want to hear? Um, give, give me three records you want to hear that's in the charts. Because you know they haven't got a bloody clue what they want to hear. So she stands there looking vacant and blank for about 30 seconds. And then um, she says, well, you're the professional, you're the DJ. Well, why did you come and 
if you don't know what you want to hear, why, why did you come and speak to me in the first place? Now she's expecting me to tell her what she wants yeah. to hear. But as a DJ, surely you should know that. So, so she would say. <laughs> but this is just one of so many examples. Mm. I've actually stopped tweeting about this now because I used to get it from a gig and I used to tweet yeah, straight all, away. All, all the stupid stuff that people had said to me that night. I don't even do it anymore no. because there's so much of it it's not worth it. And it's the same old bloody things all the time anyway. This is the thing, you, by the time you've heard the, that stupid sentence for the 50th time, yeah. I, I feel like I'm getting to a certain age now. I just roll my eyes mm. when people say certain things or, or trying to understand. Don't get us wrong, I love working in clubs, it's great. Sometimes people don't understand the, the kind of music you're playing and like so they'll come and ask for a dance record or something else and you're like, well, you know, there's a remix. Guns and Roses. There's a remix. There's a remix. There's a remix. But the best, thing, the best thing that pops in my mind, just off the top of the dome, was um, recently I was asked for Spice Girls and uh, is there not a hip hop mix I could do of it? So I think she was expecting me to somehow live um, strip down a Spice Girls record you know, maybe get the acapella somehow. Bring in the 24 um, track. Bring yeah, in the exactly. Two. You know, and just do all this live, or maybe just parrot the. Do you get Do you get dudes coming up to you with their phone and saying, uh, "Bro, can you play this tune? I haven't got it." Oh, plug yeah, my plug phone. It in, plug it just, in. just plug this in. They think you can plug yeah. their phone into the system and just play it just like that. Can't you just go on YouTube and um, yeah. Yeah. download that and play oh, that? Do it now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this is great to finally meet you, Mark. Thanks All for right. taking your time out here. Um, we're going to go through Thank to uh, your now show. Now we've got a radio show. Today. Exactly, the radio show. Yeah. So real quickly for people, the show, when is it on, how can people listen to it, and what's it all about? It's called The Sound of Now. It's uh, new music from across the genres, so it kind of reflects what I do now, which is not just the R&B and hip-hop stuff, but the best in Soulful House, uh, a bit of Garage, a bit of D&B, melodic Soulful D&B. Okay. Uh, it's on Saturdays, 6 to 8 p.m. And it's in Oxford, but you can listen online at ox105fm.com. Uh, wicked. And also, website as well, keep up to date with you. Yep, uh, markdevlin.co.uk is the link to everything else. So, markdevlin.co.uk, first port of call. Alright, uh, wicked. Thanks for your time, mate. Thank you, man. We're done. Let's have a good show. <laughs>